Thank you for downloading or watching our sermon series titled Redeemed in Christ. We are going through the Heidelberg Catechism. The Catechism is written in 1563 using a question and answer format. The Catechism's goal is to instruct the Lord's people to understand the Reformed faith by answering common questions from the Scripture. Please join us as we walk through this historic document and ponder the Lord's grace and mercy as we are reminded that we are redeemed in Christ. Well, we talked about anxiety the last time and how the Lord is the one who assures us that as God cares for this creation, He's going to care for us. Uh, he clothes the hills, and so He also provides the food for the birds. And so the point that Christ is making is that as God cares for this creation and is here, we see the hills or the flowers dying, the birds uh, do not do anything to prepare the food, and yet God sees to it their needs are met. We find that the implication is that we're not uh, supposed to worry. Well, the Catechism continues to go on and develop this this theme, um, pressing upon us the reality that uh, it's not so simple as hearing just do not worry and somehow we just get over it. Uh, the temptation we can have when we look at the Apostle Paul, for instance, and this is why I want to look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 going into chapter 2, is where you read this, you really get a flavor of the Apostle Paul being rather vulnerable uh, in terms of his thinking of the church, in terms of uh, his own personal struggle. And so the temptation we can have is to think that someone who's an apostle, someone who's a disciple, is not really going to have uh, this struggle because after all, they've seen the resurrected Christ. Uh, They hear the words from God. They write the inspired word. And so you would assume that such a person is not going to have any struggle with this. He's just going to know it. It's going to be part of who they are. And they're just going to kind of be a providential puppet, just kind of going through life, God pulling the strings, uh, and, and that's it. But we have the Apostle Paul actually confessing that he struggled with anxiety. And as he makes this confession, we, we can say, well then, how does the Apostle Paul move beyond this? Is this an invitation where we have this struggle, we have this issue, so we have to adjust our theology Or is there something more that goes on here? So I want to look at first knowing God's providence, which is what the Catechism wants us to do. It wants us to know God's providence. But then it wants us to truly learn uh, God's providence. And that's that's the part that we all struggle with, isn't it? The, The learning part, where it really becomes part of who we are. And so let's begin with the knowing of God's providence. Well, question 27 is laying out for us this doctrine of providence. And we say, well, what is providence? What, what does that really mean? Providence simply just means the protective care of God. And so if, if we talk about God's providence, we're just generally saying God's protection. Obviously, God's protection, particularly for his people, as Christ said, uh, what we heard, heard last time from Luke, uh, that if he cares for these ravens, he cares for the wild flowers, how much more is he going to care for the people he's redeemed? And so it's particularly his people. It's also generally this creation. Uh, this creation is under his protective care. Then when we look at what the Catechism says, as it basically adds more or, or puts more um, content on, on the skeleton, and as it puts more content on the skeleton, it wants us to understand what providence is that the Lord upholds by his power heaven and earth. In other words, as we mentioned last time, the Lord doesn't buy this earth from another God and then have to go through a learning curve to figure out all the ins and outs and the particulars of this earth. The Lord actually creates this world. But what the Catechism wants us to also understand is there's a theory we talk about as deists or or deism. And it's a view that God basically makes such a sound creation uh, that he can uh, build it up, he can create it, and he can just kind of throw it out there like a watchmaker and just let the watch do its thing. And so God's not present as a theory. But the Catechism is saying this is not what we teach. 
Uh, the Catechism wants us to understand that we believe that God is intricately attached to this creation. Not that God becomes a creature, but the moment that uh, God forgets to do something, everything's going to go out of whack. That's how intricately tied God is to this world, or I should say more precisely, how this world's tied to God. Uh, God's obviously free apart from this world, but this world is not free to exist apart from God. That's what the Catechism wants us to understand. But as God is one who's attached to this, he wants us, the Catechism wants us to understand that he watches over every detail of this creation. So it's not that God just allows this creation to exist, kind of checks in, slides a window open from heaven, looks down, goes, oh, everything's good, and then goes back to his throne room. The, the point is that God's always involved in every intricate detail of this creation. And so he sees to it all the seasons run their course, sees to it that the days run their course, uh, sees to it that everything that's supposed to happen happens as the Lord has decreed. And so this whole creation is under his providence, under his care. And again, uh, if you survey this world, you survey this creation, and you think about this world being under a curse, imagine what the glorified creation is going to be like. Uh, because it's pretty impressive uh, how precise this world functions even in a situation of being under the common curse. And so in, in terms of laying this out then from the Apostle Paul, that the Apostle Paul, as he writes this letter, he writes the second letter, or at least the second letter that we have, uh, it seems he's probably, there's another letter that he's written that's been lost, uh, most likely the harsh letter that he refers to, but at least the second letter that we have in our scriptures, as Paul writes this, he's writing to a church that doubts his apostolic credentials. And I think it's important to lay that out because for the Apostle Paul to deal with a church that doubts his credentials, you would think that, that Paul would, would, would do more to puff himself up, that, that he would do more to talk about his experiences of his conversion that he would do more to talk about the vision he had in his apostolic calling. But that's not what Paul does. The Apostle Paul, as he goes through this letter, wants the church to understand that he's not a super apostle. Because that's what this church is, 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 seems to be geared towards or desiring. Now that Paul's afflicted. Paul's one who's strong in his writing, but he's weak in his presence. In other words, the Apostle Paul's not the guys who have come to us. These men are prestigious. These are the men we want. But the Apostle Paul makes no secret about what he's endured. We find 2 Corinthians 1, just running through some of the things. It gives us the assurance that God is the one who comforts us in all our afflictions, which means the Apostle himself has felt affliction doesn't seem like the victorious Christian life in that statement. Verse 5, he says we share in Christ's suffering. So the Apostle Paul wants the church to know, yeah, it's true. I am one who has been persecuted. I am one who has suffered. I am one who gets beaten down uh, by life and things that happen. That's, that's true. That's the reality. He goes on in verse 6, if we are afflicted. So again, the Apostle Paul affirming the reality that it's not that he has just been afflicted and he's done with that chapter in his life. But now, if we are afflicted, which means that now he, he expects these afflictions are, are going to continue to come. This is not what the Corinthian church needs to hear. But nevertheless, this is what Paul says. Then in verse 8, he talks about the afflictions he experienced in Asia, which we'll visit more in the second point. And so whatever... He endured in Asia. We, we don't know the details of this. There's obviously something rather intense uh, that goes on there. There's speculation, but fundamentally we don't know. Uh, the Corinthian church might have heard of this, but Paul doesn't share it with us. So whatever it is, it's an intense suffering. So right here, if, if, if we're turning to Christianity, which I don't think we are, but if we're turning to Christianity because someone has persuaded us in the health and wealth gospel, the Apostle Paul is, is ripping this out from us, saying, listen, 
this Christian life is not necessarily going to be easy. He's not saying it's always going to be nothing but persecution and hardship. But Paul's saying, don't, don't be alarmed if these things come up. is isn't like that once you become a Christian, all of a sudden you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. Everything falls into place and everything becomes easy. There's still a struggle in this life. You still experience persecution. You experience affliction. You experience hardship. And Paul's saying, as an apostle, this is part of who I am. But as Paul speaks of these afflictions, he wants the Corinthian church to know, and it's important to put these afflictions in the context, because this isn't the Apostle Paul doing one of those things where it's like, oh, you don't know how much I've suffered. Your suffering's nothing compared to my suffering. Let me tell you how hard I have it. And so it's not Paul calling attention to his personal hardship. He wants Paul to understand that in the midst of this, while the church is trying to discount him and saying, we want the super apostles, Paul's saying, let me run you through why these afflictions come to me. Because he tells us in verse 4, he comforts us in all our afflictions, so we may be able to comfort those who are afflicted. In other words, the apostle Paul is at a place in his Christian life where he realizes this Suffering and affliction is not just for the Apostle Paul. It's not just for his own selfish gain. But Paul's saying it so he can take this affliction and he can turn and he can comfort those who experience affliction and share that burden. Verse 5, if they share in Christ's suffering, so they share in the comfort. And so Paul wants us to understand, again, the Christian life, as I mentioned, isn't just, hey man, now that you're a Christian, just expect to be stoned nearly to death in the sense of, of being executed. Uh, just expect uh, people to bring harsh persecution against you all the time. And that's the end of the story. That's not what Paul wants us to leave with. He wants us to understand that as we're identified with Christ, we will experience the sufferings of Christ. But as we're identified with Christ, we will also experience the comfort of Christ. The two hold together. And so Paul wants the church to know that. Verse 6, if we're afflicted, it's for your comfort. And so again, it's the Apostle Paul saying, listen, don't discount us because of our afflictions. We share in this for your comfort. Going on, verse 7, as they share in the sufferings, they're going to share in the comfort and the glory of Christ. So going on then, as, as Paul lays out this life in union with Christ, we have to go back to what is the analogy, what is the metaphor that Christ uses for the Christian life? And it's the cross. This is where Paul began in 1 Corinthians with the cross of Christ, the suffering of Christ, what we endure uh, in terms of Christ. But Christ tells us you got to bear your cross. This is a metaphor of the Christian life. And, and I've mentioned before, but it's a reality that, that we've sanctified the cross in such a way that, that we've lost that moment of pause. I mean, that's really what the cross is. That If you saw a cross and you're getting marched out of the city, uh, there's a moment of turmoil because you know why that cross is there. It's to hang you upon that cross so you die slowly, miserably, in a painful, horrendous death. And so the, the cross, again, it would be thinking of the electric chair, thinking of... Um, the lethal injection in that chair and, and sort of staring in that room and thinking about what that really means. And so when Christ turns to his disciples and says, bear your cross, this is a, a, a really bad pep talk if you're trying to stir up the masses. Uh, you, you don't want to say we're going to go to Jerusalem and get crucified. That's, that's an anticlimactic mission and goal. But that's what Christ wants the disciples to understand. If, if you follow me and think this is going to be easy victory and glory, immediately it says, no, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. And if you're going to follow me and be identified with me, you too will experience these sufferings and this hardship. And so what Paul wants the Corinthian church and Christians to understand is that suffering is not accidental. That's by the providence of God, he brings about this suffering and he shepherds us through this suffering. And as Paul writes this in terms of the comfort, sharing in the sufferings of Christ and the comfort of Christ, well, what's the ultimate comfort? Knowing that we share in the victory 
of Christ Jesus. That by the providence of God, because Christ has been raised from the dead, we are not going to be held in the pain and suffering of that event forever. And so the Apostle Paul wants us to have a bigger picture. God, by his providence, brings us to the suffering. God, by his providence, will bring us through the suffering. And God, by his providence, guarantees we will be victorious through it and arrive at the very goal. And so again, when, when we lay that out, we can think, well, this is easy for the Apostle Paul, right? He's had a vision, seen the resurrected Christ. I haven't seen the resurrected Christ. By the grace of God, I believe um, by the testimony of the apostles that Christ really is raised from the dead, uh, that he really is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But I, I haven't had the experiences of the Apostle Paul. I, I haven't uh, written uh, inspired scripture like the Apostle Paul has. And so you, you can read Paul saying these things and saying, yeah, it's wonderful. I'm sure if I saw the resurrected Christ too, I wouldn't struggle in doubt in this reality. But this is where Paul lays out that he himself as an apostle, and even those men who were with him, now we don't know who's with him, but he had to be a student of God's providence. He had to learn it. And so it's important to understand Paul's theology. Because a, a temptation is to think that once Paul experiences suffering, he's going to throw out all that theology, all that mumbo-jumbo, and realize it's just talk. It's not really anything of substance. But we find when we walk through the reality of what Paul says, that's not the case. That's not true at all. Because notice how Paul opens this letter with the theological truth of what the catechism is teaching us. Because the catechism, as Paul teaches and as Paul learns, wants us to take the theology that we profess and make it who we are. And so it's not just that we, we take this doctrine of providence and say, yeah, it's a great doctrine. It is. It's a wonderful, beautiful doctrine. I love how the catechism lays it out. And, and we can say that's, those are nice words. But what the catechism wants us to do now is to take these words and to take them and internalize them so they become essential to what orients us. And so we need to be conscious of our ideals as, as humans, that we are those who want to make God conform to our desires, right? I mean, this is part of providence, where God by his providence is pressing us, so we stop making God conform to what we want God to be, and we start understanding who God is as he reveals himself, and who we are to be as his redeemed creatures. And so, when we think about where that starts in the Garden of Eden, this obviously doesn't end well with Adam. This is what the Catechism is trying to prevent us from doing. It wants us to understand, this is God, this is who we are. This is how we find our life in him. So how does the Catechism encourage us along with the Apostle Paul? Well, the Catechism drives us home saying we're patient in adversity. Uh, this is basically when things do not go our way. I'm sure we've experienced this from time to time in life, uh, where we've experienced the misfortunes of this age. Maybe it's a consequence of our own sin. Maybe it's just a common curse. Maybe it's a combination of those two things. But whatever the case, we understand there's hard times. We, we feel the press of God's hand upon us. And so the Catechism is saying, when we understand providence, we're patient through this time, believing God is shepherding us through this. Thankful in prosperity. And the Catechism isn't telling us these are the only two extremes in life. You're either going to be absolute poverty or living in absolute wealth. The Catechism is just covering the gamut, and, and the assumption is that there's anything in between these two extremes. But in terms of prosperity, what, what are we saying? We're not saying it's my wisdom, it's my doing, but we're saying thank you, God, for giving me the experience. Thank you, God, for in your providence opening up these opportunities. Thank you, God, for whatever reason blessing us. And so in, instead of saying, well, this is my hands and what I have done, it's saying, no, simply thank you, God. By your providence, you have allowed this to work out. 
But the Catechism goes on. And the Catechism wants us to understand that the confidence we have is truly in our Father, in our God. That the peace that we have is something that is ours only in Him. Because notice what we learned last week. The assurance was, and the movement was, if God cares for this creation, how much more for you? He's sovereign. Now the Catechism builds on this. And it tells us that no creature can separate us from his will. So we have God our Father, identified as a benevolent Father, caretaker of this creation, caretaker of us. And then it goes on to say, and no creature will separate us from his will. This means that whatever we endure, God's not ignorant of it. God knows exactly what's going on. Now, there, there is a reality here where, where there is something harsh. Sometimes it becomes a tough pill to swallow when we experience hardship. We can wonder why God is doing this. And we don't know. I'd argue this is why the Lord gives us the book of Job. That we see a man who in a lot of ways, or, or as we can see, has not directly deserved uh, what Satan did to him with the permission of God. But yet we see how at the end of the book, Satan in Job 42.5 finally says, now I see you. It's not that Job literally saw God standing before him, but Job literally understood, I understand now. I'm a mere mortal. You are God. I see how this is. As the Catechism goes on, no creature can overpower God, no creature can overrule God, even as we see in Job. Satan could not usurp the will of God, even as a challenge is made. This man will curse you to your face. And we see that even Satan, a fallen angel, uh, who was with God even before the creation, as, as we see in the testimony of Christ, could not overpower the Lord. But it goes on to say that all creatures are in his hand and move by his will. I mean, you really think about that statement. Because as, as I thought about that, there's times when this might surprise you, but sometimes I forget things throughout the day and forget to do something. And you think about what, what would happen if that happened with God, if he forgot to do something. I mean, what, what if he forgot to close the day? I mean, that, that could be catastrophic. And so you really start thinking about all the creatures, this whole creation's in his hand. Nothing happens without his will. God doesn't need a to-do list. I mean, that alone is pretty magnificent. This is what the Catechism is assuring us, to put us in awe of our God. And so how does Paul theologically do this? Because remember, our temptation is to think, well, this is just theology. This is just stuff we learned. We really need something more practical. And the practical stuff is what's going to help us really formulate our theology. But notice how Paul begins to this church that doubts his apostolic credentials. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, he's calling attention to who God is, as the Catechism does. The Father of all. This is our Father, the one who has called us. This is our God who has called his people throughout all the ages. But he is a Father of mercy which tells us how we become part of this family by the mercy of God, that, that he was kind to us. He, this is really God in his condescending benevolence coming to us and saying, you are going to be my children. I will be your father. But notice also that it's not just the father of mercies, because again, that's, that's a marvelous thing that the great God of heaven would be concerned with any of us. But he's a God of all comfort which tells us that, that God is not just one who's ruling over us and being tyrannical or just using us as little pawns in his war, but he truly comforts us. He, he truly grants us what, what we stand in need of to, to get through this age, that there's a, a personal consoling that God has done. And so when you start now going through what the Apostle Paul has said, you know, we're afflicted, so we can comfort you. Share in Christ's affliction. Share in his comfort. Verse 5. The apostles uh, live up to this call. They become the comfort of the church. Verse 6. We have then 
uh, this continual reminder of sharing in the comfort of Christ. And so now you have the Apostle Paul not saying that we as the apostles are the ones who secure your faith, therefore you need to be confident in us. The apostles are merely saying we're the conduit that brings the, the gospel doctrine, the gospel life, and brings us to the church so you have comfort. And again, we, we hear this, and we say, okay, yes, Paul's the one who had the vision of Christ. Of course it's easy for Paul to say that, but this is where Paul goes on and gets very personal and actually confesses his struggle. Where he says, we do not want you to be unaware. So now this church is doubting Paul's apostolic credentials. He says, this is the father of comfort, the father of mercy. He says, now I, I want you to know something. Be aware of this. Say, we experience afflictions in Asia, so it's probably this church knows of whatever has happened. And he says, we were burdened. So Paul's feeling the weight of of this burden, uh, understanding the, the reality of this. And we say, okay, so he's burdened. But he says, we're burdened beyond our strength. So it's kind of what we mentioned this morning, that the Lord will push us to see what we're made of at times, And then he will push us beyond that uh, to break us. This is where the Apostle Paul is brought in Asia. And as he experienced this, notice what he says. So that we despaired. He uses despaired of life itself. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying that when we looked at what was going on, we felt as if there was no hope, no comfort, no mercy, nothing. And so it's important to understand the force of this. That the Apostle Paul and those who are going around planting churches know what it feels like to experience being pushed to this place of feeling as if there's no hope. So if we're tempted to think the Apostle Paul is just a providential puppet, a guy who just had an incredible vision and doesn't really know what it is like to experience just a turmoil that sometimes we can feel as if God is not present. The Apostle Paul is saying, we were there. I confess it. We despaired of life itself. That they felt as if they received the sentence of death. Now when he says felt, this makes us a subjective thing. Some people uh, speculate that they actually had a death sentence communicated against them uh, from a government official of some sort. Uh, It doesn't seem that that's really what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, basically, as I look at my life and I look at the outcome, we're not getting out of this. This is death. This is what we feel, uh, whether it's a spiritual death, whatever's going on, there is an intense turmoil. Now, I'm not saying Paul apostatized because Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, speaking of where they were pressed, afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. So Paul is not saying that that he stays here. He's not saying that he's apostatized from the gospel. So let's, let's be clear. But what Paul is saying is he's experienced the pain of this age. He's experienced the turmoil of what can happen. And he wonders, it seems, where is God in the midst of this? He's a spirit of life. He doesn't see a way out. So the apostle Paul knows what this feels like. Now, a temptation we can have is to say, well, then Paul needs to adjust his theology to fit his experience, right? Because he he has this intense moment, so clearly his theology is not going to give him hope in this moment. But it's actually just the opposite. It it really is the opposite. It's where Paul experiences, and, and where does he turn? He turns to realize the point of this. And so Paul doesn't rely on himself. I mean, you read Paul's writings. The the man is an incredible writer, an incredible master of language, a man who understands logic and rhetoric, a man who is incredibly gifted. And so you can see a temptation of a guy who was a Pharisee tempted to rely on himself. But he's saying there's actually something good that comes about this in the providence of God. Because I'm no longer relying on myself. Now, it's not that Paul just becomes this uh, existentialist or this nihilist where he says, oh, there's no meaning to life. 
Uh, it's all meaningless. There is no hope. We should just die because there's nothing beyond this anyway. That's not where Paul goes. Paul basically empties himself of all hope, and where does he turn? He turns to the living God. And he realizes that Paul himself is relying on Paul, and he needs to rely on God. And now notice the beauty of this. I mean, if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 15 and how the Corinthian church is kind of indifferent to the resurrection, where does Paul turn in his mind? Well, what does he profess? What does he meditate on? On the God who raises the dead. That the Apostle Paul, all of a sudden this doctrine that we might think isn't that important, all of a sudden takes root within him. And he starts thinking, wait a minute, what do I know of my God? My God isn't the Lord of the dead. He's the Lord of the living. He's not the God who has come to kill. He's a God who has come to make his people alive. And so the comfort he turns to and where he puts his mind, this teaches us something profound. These things that he has said in the opening of the letter, he's saying this stuff became real to me in Asia. I'm not just writing about the father of comfort. I'm not just writing about the father of mercies. This is real for me. When I went to Asia, I made a point in my Christian life where I moved from this stuff merely being a theological truth to something that actually oriented uh, my being and transformed me in such a way that I realized my hope is not in me. I cannot rest in the Apostle Paul is what he's saying. I need to rest in the God of the resurrection. And that's where he puts his hope, that he will deliver us. So as Paul is in the midst of this, what seems to be despair for this moment, he turns and says, wait a minute. My God is a faithful God. My Father is a Father of mercies. My Father is a Father of comfort. My Father is a one who has raised Christ from the dead. That is what empowers me, that he is the Lord of the living who conquers death. He goes on then to encourage this church to pray for him and for the apostles. To put it simply, the apostle Paul has that Job moment in Job 42.5. With all the fighting, all the bickering you read in Job, if only I could have my day in the Lord's court, I'll set him straight. If only I can meet with him. Finally, God says, fine. Gird up your loins like a man. You want to fight? We'll fight. Let's go. And so they wrestle, they they engage in their argument, and Job is left speechless. First time has sort of a snarky uh, response to God, and it's finally in Job 42.5 where he puts his hand over his mouth and truly recognizes, now I see you. It's not that Job didn't know God, it's not that the Apostle Paul didn't know Christ, it's that in that moment, in that pressing, Because we may ask, well, why does God press us? Why does God push us to that place? So we see in his providential care, this is not just a doctrine. These are not just words. This is something that truly orients us in the comfort of the gospel, the assurance that the Father of all mercies, the God of the resurrection, does not abandon his people. That's the assurance the Apostle Paul came away with. He doesn't adjust his theology. It's rather his theology adjusts the Apostle Paul and truly takes root within him and he recognizes the God that he serves. And so when we ask that question, how does the Apostle Paul move beyond his his anxiety, his own personal uh, tension that he experiences, this affliction, what is his comfort? His comfort is that the gospel becomes real. That's the simple answer. He recognizes that God does not turn his back on his people. And Paul gets pushed to a point and pressed to a point where he has to truly return to the question, do I believe this or not? And as the Apostle Paul believes this, he recognizes the lesson that God is at least teaching him not to rely on himself, but to rely on the living God. This is what the catechism is trying to drive home in terms of the doctrine of providence. 
This isn't just words. This, this isn't just something that's nice to think about or to debate as a theologian. It's something that the Catechism wants us to understand. This has to orient who we are. That we really believe we serve a sovereign God. We, we have to come to grips with that. But it's not just that God is sovereign in the sense that we tremble in his presence. And yes, we certainly have the awe, we, we have the reverence of him. I'm not minimizing that. But we have to understand how God comes to us. He comes to us because he wants us as his people. That's the other thing we have to come to grips with. He wants us as his people. By his mercy, he comes to us. And it's not just by his mercy he, he graces us with his presence, which again, that's, that's more than we deserve. So I don't want to minimize that either. That's more than we deserve. But it's not just he comes to us in his mercy, gracing us with his presence, allowing us to come into his presence, but he comforts us as he watches over this world, seeing all the details of this creation, so he sees to it that we will not be pushed to a place where we are so fully broken and so fully given over to despair and left in a hopeless place where there is no light at the end of the day. It's the assurance that as we rest in the gospel of Christ, we have to return to the reality that this is the God of the resurrection, the Lord of life, in any problem, any reality, anything that we face has ultimately been overcome in Christ as we are his redeemed, his people, and he will bring us into his rest. So let us then not just be a people who know our theology, but a people who really know it, really believe it, really understand it, then when we pray to God, we're really coming before him with boldness, believing as the sovereign Lord of all, he really can bring those prayers to come to pass. As we learned this morning, just in conclusion, why did God push Israel? So that as we learned in Zechariah 10, so you would call out to me, not relying on self, but relying on the Lord. Let us then put our hope and comfort in our King. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.